how do you navigate the pleasure signals in your, in your, I guess, your gut or your brain telling you or in, that might tell you, that tells a lot of people, here's a candy bar, here's a cookie, here's a milkshake, I want to eat this now. How have you trained your mind and your gut microbiome to not be tempted and want it and crave it consistently? Yeah. Or is the craving there, but you've just created standards and food rules to support yourself in minimizing those temptations? Yeah. I, well, I don't know that I've worked it out completely. I mean, I have my cravings. <laughs> my, if you ask my wife who, who um, you know, if there's a bag of potato chips, she'll finish it if it's open. Um, I am fairly disciplined. And some of it is just being mindful. You know, I've thought a lot about food and nutrition, and I have um, uh, researched it in great, you know, so asking yourself a set of questions, you know, am I still hungry or am I just enjoying eating? That's a big one. You know, Americans are socialized. I mean, think about what your mom said to you. She said, are you full when she fed you, right? She didn't say, are you satisfied? That's the right question. Mm. Or are you no longer hungry? Because the moment you're no longer hungry is many bites before you're full. <laughs> right. You should stop eating. Then. Exactly. And so I often will ask myself, so am I still hungry or am I just eating because there's more on the plate? And, um, and then I enjoy the process. And, you know, in, in other countries, um, I talk about this in, in uh, my master class, there, there are sayings. Um, in Japan, they say harahachibu, which means eat until you're 80% full. That's interesting. Mm. And in the Arab world, they say you should eat till you're three quarters full. In France, uh, the, the, they, they don't say, parents don't say to kids, are you, are you full? They say, do you still have hunger? And so it's a different way of socializing appetite. In America, it's like, are you eat, stuffed? Eat, <laughs> eat until you cannot eat anymore. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> way past hunger. Way past hunger. And there's two more courses to come, so we got to finish them. Yeah. So it's the goal is satisfaction. It's mm. not. It's not making yourself full. How do we get to satisfaction when people have been training yeah. and conditioning themselves for well, decades? We are up to against eat past. Yes, satisfaction. we are up a powerful industry. I mean, I I can't um, uh, overestimate how important food marketing is. I mean. The, the industry spends like $40 billion getting us to eat more. It's in every commercial, it seems like. Absolutely. It's either drugs or food. Yeah. In I every candy eat, commercial. Yeah. I bet you can't eat just one. You know, the old Lay's uh, potato chip commercial. And, and in fact, food scientists talk about craveability as, a, as, a, as a something they're designing into the food. And they can do that. They know how to do that. And... There, you know, we're being manipulated by the food science and the marketing. So it's it's a struggle, because in in other countries, America's somewhat unique in food because we don't have a single old traditional food culture. You know, in most cultures, mm. you would eat the way your parents ate growing up, the way their parents ate growing up, and people knew what food was, what wasn't food. This is what we traditionally eat. In America, since we're you know, a mongrel nation, you know, drawn from so many different cultures, uh, immigrant uh, nation, we don't have a single dominant food culture. And I think that has left mm. us vulnerable to marketing and to fads. And so America will change the way it eats overnight. Um, you know, I, I'm, I remember the, the low fat craze, you know, that was like when I was growing up, you know, fat was the evil nutrient. You shouldn't eat fat. And, um, and then suddenly in 2002, I can, I know exactly when it happened. It was like, um, it's not fat that makes you fat. It's sugar that get, makes you fat carbs. So then we had the campaign against carbs and, and overnight in 2002, and it was one article published was in the Atk New York Times. Was it Atkins or was that? A it was, well, Atkins was behind it, but it was a writer named Gary Taubes. Huh. And it was like, what if it's all a big fat lie? That was, it was a cover good, story in the times. Good, good headline. Good headline. Yeah. And, Suddenly, like uh, donut companies were going out, of, uh, were going out of business, and bread companies were going out of business because everybody was was demonizing carbohydrates. Wow! And and we're still kind of in that world and celebrating protein. Protein now is the is the good nutrient. Carbs are the evil nutrient. Fat is depending on what world you're in. If you're in the keto world, fat's fine. If you're in the right, <laughs> so 
you know, we're, we're crazy about food. We really are confused, um, fashion conscious, fashion driven. And it's no wonder because we're getting these messages. You know, the grocery store is full of foods being sold on the basis of health that aren't healthy. So no wonder we're confused. Um, you know, the, the food in the supermarket that screams loudest about its virtues is all in the middle aisles. It's all processed food with packages. You, the healthiest food is the produce section where the food is like you know, sitting there quietly because it doesn't have packages. <laughs> yeah, by the corner, yeah, there's no packaging. <laughs> it's, it's intimidated. You're starting to see some like, I don't know, Apple companies putting a yeah. plastic, you know, yeah, wrapping in bags and here's some marketing behind this. Yeah, but I mean, the real health claims should go on that stuff. Yes. Um, but of course, you know, they don't, farmers don't have money to, to they don't do that. research yeah. the health claims. I'm curious, it's... You know, I don't know the, the statistics, but you mentioned about marketing. Would you say $40 billion a year, as we said, yeah. in the food industry in terms of yeah. marketing and ad spend? And, and to compare that to how much the government spends informing us about health and food, the food pyramid or whatever, my plate. And it's, it's the equivalent of a single SKU, a single product from Frito-Lay. Um, oh, my gosh. And so... The, the message, any kind of health message about food is drowned out by the marketing. That's message. crazy. So 40 billion a year on the food industry to market you products that probably 99% aren't actually Not, healthy. Yeah. Um, and that are formulated to scientifically get you hooked. Get you to eat more and, and play on your dopamine system and, you know, give you those kind of satisfactions. I want this now. And, and people might say, well, you know, your parents cooking for you, they're also trying to get you to eat. Um, but they're not trying to get you to overeat. Yes. Your parents are, are trying to satisfy you with food and the food industry is trying to addict you with food. That's a very different approaches. Where do you think, do you know how much the medical world, the drug industry spends a year in advertising? I don't know that number. I'm curious what that is, but I, I'm curious your thoughts. If there was a, a law that banned all food marketing and all drug marketing. Because <laughs> I believe these food marketing and the drug marketing is making us sicker. Yeah. It's not helping us get to the root of healing uh, intuitively and organically. It's masking, it's putting over and layers. Confusing, of, and confusing, confusing you. It's, it's telling you you're gonna get healthier, but it's not the case. If there was a ban against all food marketing and all drug marketing on everywhere, TV, yeah. podcast, everywhere, do you think the country would get healthier or what do you think would happen if there was no marketing for food or drugs? It's a great question. I think we'd be a lot healthier. I think we would. I think culture would step into that gap and culture has a lot of wisdom about food and, um, and we don't listen to it nearly enough. Or science would step into the gap too with and we you know we'd get our scientific information not from pharmaceutical companies as we do now the other interesting phenomenon though is how much of those pharmaceutical products you see advertised on tv are expressly designed to undo the effects of a diet right yeah and uh it's a lot of them everything for diabetes is about dealing with type two diabetes is a product of the food system, right? I mean, rates have gone up with obesity um, and that we are spending. So we spend about three quarters of all, all spending in healthcare goes to treat chronic diseases. Of that, how much now, is some that of it is smoking, food? some of right. it's smoking and alcohol. If you take out alcohol and smoking, how much is related to food? It's something like $500 billion out of $750 billion. Oh my gosh. Um, it's a huge number. But how much is, of chronic disease is related to food and nutrition? Most of it. Most of it. Versus smoking or drugs or alcohol. Yeah, Mo so most of it. 80, 90%. Food, no, the, the American diet, the standard American diet is what is killing most of us. That is what most people die of. Um, and, and I'm talking about several types of cancer that are linked to it. Heart disease, obviously linked to diet and diabetes, which has become a really big killer. It is, it is the way we're eating that is doing this to us mm. and that we could save a fortune by changing the way we eat in, in healthcare spending. Um, and no doubt we could improve longevity as well. 
it's it it's the elephant in the room is the American food system. And we all take it to be as like normal. And and the food still looks the same. Pizza looks like pizza and you know, these, you know, convenient frozen dishes in the in the grocer's freezer. But it's not the same. That that, you know, that packaged ravioli or tomato sauce is not what those things were or should be. Right. So um in a way, it's the, an easy fix and it's a hard fix. I remember I was speaking, I was giving a speech to a group of health insurance executives um, and I was trying to enlist <laughs> their support for reform of the food system, which is one of my causes. And, they don't want that though. Well, Why well it, the reason it was very interesting and I was saying, you know, you guys should be allies of the, of the food reform movement because every case of type 2 diabetes you prevent is $400,000 to your bottom line. That's how much it costs to treat each case over the life of that person. $400,000. $400,000 for Holy something God. that can be completely prevented. And one of the presidents of these organizations came up to me after and says, you don't understand. We don't have a long-term interest in your health because the churn. Oh my gosh. <laughs> because the churn, because medical uh, contracts for medical insurance are only one year, and people are constantly switching plans, and companies are constantly switching plans. So we don't, you know, you're talking about something that is going to benefit you over years, and we don't care about that. Um, and I realized there, there's a simple fix. How about five-year contracts for health insurance? Mm. That would s completely change the the um, the incentives for the insurance company, and they would start talking to us about prevention. Interesting, because they don't they benefit when we are sick. Well, I don't know that they benefit, but they don't benefit when we when we prevent. Uh, when we're super healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they're not invested in preventive medicine. And, and that. Wow. And, and the drug companies aren't. Oh, they, they, they benefit don't make, enormously when from we're chronic sick. disease. Sure. That's the only way they make money. Yeah. Ozempec. I mean, right. Everybody's on taking Ozempec for diabetes and weight loss now. How and much money are these drug companies making? I don't have any figures. It's, no. a, it's a huge industry. Huge. And, um, and, you know, their business model, too, is some drug you have to take every day of the rest of your life. And, um, but that doesn't cure the illness. No, they're, they're not cures for the illness. They're just dealing with the symptoms. And that's true for mental health drugs, too. Yeah. SSRIs don't cure depression. I mean, they, they you know, tamp down symptoms when they work. What is the greatest cure for depression without, with, without any drugs? I would say exercise. It's huge. And eating real food. I think you do those two things. Now, it's not going to work for everybody. Some people have depression caused by trauma and, and um, you know, all sorts of different factors. But those two things can make a huge difference. I don't think we fully recognize the mental health impacts of the way we're eating. When you're eating a diet that is, for example, has lots of sugar in it, you're going to be on an emotional roller coaster. I mean, watch kids with sugar, you know, and um, they think that, chocolate or this kind of sweetened cereal makes them happy. And it does for a little while, but Five they minutes, crash. And yeah. then chaos. <laughs> and that's true for us too. We have these ups and downs during the day that have a lot to do with, um, with our sugar, you know, intake. And, um, and then when we, you know, we, we get this spike and it has to do with glucose release and things like that. And then we crash. And the solution to that is more, more sugar. So Snacking is another thing too. We're, you know, meals, meals are like a really good human institution. <laughs> snacking, you know, we're eating, you know, all day long. How bad is snacking for our, our, our gut microbiome, for our brain and for our overall just metabolism? If we're eating meals and then snacking a little bit here and there in between. I mean, I don't think snacking is like evil or anything. And I think a lot depends on what you have. Um, uh, I snack. I'm a writer. So, you know, I'm at my desk. I'm supposed to get up. That's the other, that's the competing value, right? You should stand every half hour yeah, and move a little bit. Yeah. And where do you go? You go to the, you go to the kitchen and, yeah, grab a little. and you, you heat up your coffee or you pour a cup of tea. And then you have, you know, a little have, some, some nuts or some I'll have a handful <laughs> of nuts or dried fruit. Yeah, definitely. And I'm not like Obama. I don't count my almonds as he allegedly did. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, so I, I think snacking, you kind of lose, you lose sight of how much you're eating. Um, it just becomes kind of invisible. Um, so, I mean, I think it's something that people have to be careful about, but I, I don't, I don't believe in being punitive 
uh, mm-hmm. about it. But I think eating meals with other people, you know, we're talking about food as if it's this transaction between us and this stuff. But meals, eating with other people affects how you eat. You, you know, when you're eating with other people, you put down the fork and talk and then you pick it up and there's more time. And the more time you spend eating, the more likely you are to know when you're full. Mm. It takes 20 minutes for the body to send you the news like, enough, we're full. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. So if you're eating really fast, you're defeating that signal. And so you're eating too much. But if you have a leisurely meal, you're much more likely to, to realize, you know, I think I've had enough. It's interesting because I was just having a, a breakfast meeting this morning. And I probably went for about an hour and a half, right? And it was a great meeting and meal because I noticed that I did not finish my plate. Mm-hmm. I had, you were engaged. You were I, was enga- I was talking and then I'd eat a little bit when they were talking, you know, and, and have a few bites. And then I would... You know, have my fork here with food and be like talking to them and just like, okay, let me listen, engage. And it got to the point, and I didn't have a lot. I had two eggs, scrambled eggs. I had a couple pieces of bacon and I had some, you know, potatoes, kind of the standard Mm -hmm. breakfast. breakfast, Yeah, exactly, right? Um, And I I was eating the potatoes and I was like, huh, okay, I'm getting pretty full. And I just left the last potato. And I was like, let me just experiment. (laughs) I left it on the table and I could have eaten it easily. But I left it because I was like, I actually feel pretty satisfied. Well, that clean plate ethic is really bad. (laughs) I mean, why? I mean, when you're done eating, it's okay if you leave something on the plate. And in fact, it's a good practice. Just make a point. I'm not going to eat the last thing on my plate. Just as 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 an exercise. Now, what if you're like, well, I don't want to waste food. Well, yeah, I know. And that's what we were brought up. People are starving in Korea or whatever. Yeah, yeah. The thing you heard from your parents. So it's not going to help them if you leave a potato. Maybe you should take less at the beginning or maybe, you know, portion size is a huge problem. Huge. Don't get the appetizers. Don't get the desserts. You know, have. We tend to think that the amount of food put in front of us is the proper amount to eat. It's usually probably double what we're supposed yeah, to eat. And, and for food, for restaurants, they've learned that um, we appreciate ampleness and the cost of the food is one of their lowest costs. And so they give us portions that are too big. And we, we compliment a restaurant for having big portions. Um, you feel like you're getting more for your value. Yeah, you feel, you feel you're getting good value. And, uh, and the economics definitely work for the restaurants, but uh, it doesn't work for us. Um, so we end up, big portions are definitely part of, part of our problem. So you mentioned before, you know, two great ways to minimize or decrease depression for a human being is healthy nutrition and exercise. exercise yeah. Those two things. Yeah. If someone is getting f- some sunlight is really good too. Sunlight, you probably know? probably quality sleep as well. Really. Oh helps yeah. You. I mean, it, people who are depressed often have trouble sleeping. But one of the ways to fix your circadian rhythms is make sure every morning you you look at the sun. You go yeah. outside, even if it's cloudy. Just look at where it should be, and that 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 information comes through your eyes to your brain and kind of sets your clock and it will improve your sleep. Yeah, Dr. Andrew Huberman has done a lot of research on yeah, that and, and preaches it almost every day yep. about the research. That and, and breathing, post- yeah. He says that's the number. his number one health tip is get outside and look at the sun. First thing in the morning, yeah. right? Yeah. Not when it's already up and you no, can't look I mean, at it. And, and it's, it's okay blinding. if you didn't get up at dawn, but, you know, before midday. Yeah, get up for 10, 15 minutes and look yeah. towards the sun, right? Just allow your eyes to gaze towards it. And you'll be getting outside and you'll be getting some vitamin D. Because nature. Because we spend way too much time inside. Yeah. Being, being outside is, you know, I mean, exercising outside, I think, is better for us than inside. What do you think is the root cause of depression? Why someone could get depressed or chronic depression? Because we all go through sadness and grief sure. and loss and heartache and, you know, relationships and deaths and, you know, career ending, things like that, where there might be a, a, a well, season of sadness. Yeah, but the chronic depression, what is the root cause of that? I don't think we know. Uh, you know, there are people looking for the genes implicated in depression. They have not had success finding them. Um, there is depression caused by events. Uh, people with a cancer diagnosis get depressed. We understand exactly why. Mm-hmm. And if they're healed or cured, their depression might lift. But then you have other people, and I've interviewed them in my, in my research on psychedelics, who've been depressed for 30 years without a break. 
And I don't think we really understand that. They're sold as plant-based. And I would always watch out for that phrase because it, it, can, it sounds really good. It has an aura of health around it. But how about just plant? <laughs> Right. Why plant-based? One ingredient. One ingredient. Plant carrot. Exactly. <laughs> One ingredient food.